Welcome back to AC News, I'm Jack Ward. Leading Senior Constable Mark Stevens has been in the Victorian Police Force for 37 years, 33 years here in Ararat. He's a local legend who is retiring from the force this Wednesday to spend time with his family and enjoy some well-earned holidays. Mark, I want to go back to kind of your starting with Victoria Police. So why did you choose a career with Vic Police? Uh, I just saw an ad somewhere about the, the police force. Well, you, know, you go into the academy, they pay you to be in school, pretty much. And then you come out, you're, you know, after five months, you're hopefully a police officer. So I thought, well, that sounds like a plan. And I talked to my dad about it. He said, I want to have a crack at being a policeman. He said, go for it. And what were so, your first days like as a police officer? Were you nervous? Well, talk me through it. Well, a after graduating? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well... My first official duty was at um, well, Waverley Park, which was an AFL or VFL football ground back in the day. But you know, we had the new uniform and the nice clean cap and the big overcoats with the big broad shoulders in them. And you know, I'm only a little fella, but I felt ten foot tall. When I got to the South, South Melbourne Police Station, which was my first training station, and they give me the gun and all that sort of thing, and then you had to go into the senior sergeant into the boss's office and. He gave you a bit of spiel. Um, the best, and he was a, a he became a, a pretty senior detective at the homicide squad. And I'll never forget this. He said, "You've just been in the academy for five months, learning all about your law and everything like that. Forget it. I'll put you on the divvy van with people that have been in the job and been working the streets, and they'll teach you how to be a copper. And you know, after that, you know, I've learnt. You learn on the ground." You did learn all the, the basic stuff in the academy, but uh, you do your training with your firearms, and they put you in scenarios, and you know it's not real. Mm. But um, yeah, but when you get out in the real world, especially South Melbourne, um, I don't know what it's like now because I don't go to Melbourne much, but back then South Melbourne was a pretty seedy suburb, mm. and there was some scary stuff happening. Like we used to get called to 30-storey um, commission flats, like high-rise flats, uh, and we were instructed not to wear our hats when we went to do a job there because you couldn't see, because you peek on your hat, you couldn't see the toasters and microwave and that getting thrown off the balconies at you while you're walking in there. So pretty scary stuff. Uh, one time, oh, back in 91, I think, um, I had a, a, a mentally ill person come at me with a knife. That was a bit scary. Had a bit of time off work after that. And, yeah, that's one time... I've had my gun out. I haven't used it, haven't shot at a person, but I've had it out a couple of times. So I've been, yeah, I've been pretty close to the edge a couple of times. <laughs> and but I guess that comes with the territory, obviously. It does. Yeah, you've got to accept that. Um, one thing they they can give you all the training they like, but it doesn't override your human instinct to survive. And you've got that much stuff that's going through your head, and you've got to process all these policies and, and guidelines and everything that they're drumming into you and all the time you're thinking I've got to survive this. What's the difference when you come from Melbourne out here to the country what were the differences? Uh, there's no high-rise flats for a start. Um, different, it's a slower pace and it's always, and, and it's like that now, I go to Melbourne now, I, I couldn't last in Melbourne now, it's just too quick for me because I'm, I'm, A, I'm old, B, it's just changed and I've been used to this lifestyle. Um, but yeah, different people. Um, different attitudes, like, you know, up here if you cut someone off and you go, oh, sorry, mate, they go, oh, it's all good down there, oh, yeah, mouthful out the window and they swear and they try and ram you off the road. But it's far more relaxed up here. Mind you, I've been to a few situations um, that were a bit scary and reminded me of Melbourne, but having time in Melbourne helped me deal with it. You've touched on some of the, like, I guess, key key moments in your career, yeah. over the past 36 years, what have been some of your most memorable? Um, I don't know, getting medals, just for, they weren't for doing anything outstanding, just for being in the job. Um, that's sort of a proud moment, because you know, take, I took my kids to a few of them, I took my grandkids to a few of them, the ceremonies and that, and that, because I don't take work home, and that's, you know, they see me in my uniform, and that's about it, they don't know what I do. Uh, I got a couple of citations. Um, I got one with this um, lady with the knife I was talking about. I got congratulated by the superintendent for not resorting to lethal violence, if if you will. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I've got a couple of other um, things I did in Melbourne that I, you know, well, it's just part of your job. You're a proud police officer. Yeah. What does pr- protecting the community mean to you? Well, it's just what you do. It's it, 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 police, police aside, you know, people should look after people. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. You know, it doesn't matter if you drive a Mercedes or a, a gopher scooter. You know, people are people, and uh, sadly, it's becoming more in our nature to destroy each other rather than look after each other. But it's just like family. Just look after each other. It's good to succeed in just making a difference. And I bet you've heard some great excuses for getting out of tickets over the years. Oh yeah. Any examples? Uh, look, I had. This is a sad one, really, but he got his comeuppance. Um, I had one fellow, and this is to show we have a compassionate side. I had a guy going a bit quick one night, and he had his mum in the car, and he's heading towards Melbourne, and he got out the car and said, oh, look, I'm sorry I'm splurting. Uh, my brother's had a bad motorbike accident, and he's in the coma, he's in the Alfred, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, mate, away you go. And on the offside, I said, oh, geez, that's a bit bad. I said, oh, I hope he's not lying. Anyway, three days later, it was a long weekend. Three days later, I pull up, to, pull up this car for speeding. And I said, geez, that car looks familiar. Anyway, gets out the car. Bingo, got ya. Anyway, he um, he said, oh, look, mate, sorry, I know I speed. And my brother's had a motorbike accident. I've got to get to Horsham. He's in hospital in Horsham. And he didn't recognise me, obviously. I said, well, that's no good. He said, no. I said, but there must have been some improvement. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the other day when I pulled you over, he was in the Alfred in a coma, so if they've transferred him to Horsham, I guess he's on the mend. And he looked at me, I said, yeah, mate, 9,000 coppers in the state, and you got the same one twice. But he he burnt a lot of... Um, like, I don't, don't cop a lot of excuses anymore. And at the end of the day, it's a law, and there is no justified reason for breaking any law. Uh, my wife actually yelled at me when... My father was dying. We got a call, phone call. He was in Geelong, and we got in the car. And the wife said, "You know, why aren't you speeding?" I said, "Well, I can't. You know, I just can't do it. You know, Dad, Dad'll be there. I missed him by 15 minutes, but you know, at the end of the day, um, you can't do it. You can't justify going too fast." Looking back on that, are you, yeah. like, well, you didn't speed that day, or not? No, yeah. no, no. No, I'm not annoyed. I'm. I'm a bit upset that I didn't leave home a bit earlier, but um, it, it is what it is. Uh, I could, I had my wife and, and I think two or three of my kids in the car, and I can't put them at risk for my for my needs. You know, I needed to be there for my dad. I couldn't be, um, and it's just the way it was. Um, but because for two thirds of my life. I'm upholding the law, and, and that's a law, and I've, I've, you know, I've got to abide by it. What have been some of the most significant changes in the role of the Highway Patrol during your time in the force? Um, well, technology. We had one computer at South Melbourne when I was there, and you'd type in a rego number and, and maybe get the check back in four hours. Um, name checks would have to be telexed off to the Information Bureau, which would have to go to a filing cabinet and go through alphabetically all these cards to look for this dude's name. And then they go to another drawer to get his history. But now it's all, I can do it all on my fingertips. I, I can do it, I've got a personal issue iPad. I can do car checks, name checks, whatever I want in a car. What are you going to miss most about policing? What am I going to miss? Mm. Uh, I don't know, the camaraderie. It's one of those jobs where you have a, have a few mates and you have a few acquaintances and you have a couple of really good mates and when you become a policeman you probably only end up with a couple of good mates outside it because the others are going to oh, bloody copper. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the camaraderie, it's like a family here and I'm going to miss that a hell of a lot. Especially other people that have been around here for 10 years or so, there's a few of those here. Sandra, she's our clerk, she was here when I got here and she's still here. Um, yeah, I'm going to miss it, because, yeah, been here for, well, 33 years here, so it's going to be hard to walk away, but I've got to do it. Yes, that, yeah, that brings me to my next question. Why now? Why is now the right time for you to retire? Um, oh, that's a good question, too. I think I've done... I don't feel like I'm... 
uh, well, I'm still making a difference, but I'm not going beyond that. I, I don't. I'm not getting the enjoyment out of doing it like I was. Uh, and I want to get out before I'm crippled, so I can do all the travelling and that I haven't been able to do over the years because uh, we've only had the one wage and I had a big family, so uh, all the money goes elsewhere. So I'm just going to travel and and do a bit and, and get a lot of this stuff that's in here from this job out. And, you know, because there's a lot of muddly stuff in there at the moment. Um, a lot of issues inside and outside the job I'm dealing with at the moment over the last couple of weeks. But um, I've just got to... And I spoke to my dad about it. And I said, you can remember doing stuff when you were four and you are 80. Well, I can't remember my teenage years. He said, well, you've got a lot of stuff in there that you've got to keep, and all that stuff gets pushed to the back. But as you slow down, you'll get memories. Because I've got to get all this stuff out of here, apart from a few good memories and the camaraderie and that, before I can focus on anything else, because it's just been such a big part of me. What's your message to the Arab community? Ooh. <coughs> Work together, help each other, help us. Um, no, I'll help the police force that is, it won't be us shortly, um, but just, I don't know, just try and do the right thing. Yeah, it's, it's a good community. There are some people in here that, uh, in this community, that, that they aren't very nice. Uh, and, you know, they might not have had an upbringing, a, a very good upbringing, but a lot of people use that as an excuse. People have just got to learn, you know, like this, at the end of the day, we're here for a good time, not a long time. You're born, you make the most of what you can, and then you die. And how you choose to spend it, it's up to you, really. And Dad passed that on, you know, you've got to be working. If you're not at school, you've got to be working. You've spoken about your dad a lot. Do you reckon he'd be proud of you? Oh, yeah. 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 He, 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 he told me that. He got, got to tell me that before he died. But um, I think he was proud of me the day he drove me down to the academy on, on the first Monday morning I started. The one thing I regret was not spending enough time with him. Yeah, I should have made more of an effort to spend more time with him. It's, you only get one set of parents and when you lose one, but, you know, like, yeah, okay, people say he's old, but you, know, you don't think your mum and dad has been old, they're just there, you know. Mum's still going, she's 87. But yeah, dad, mum and dad both proud of me. If you have a local legend nomination, head to our website at acnews.org. That ends this bulletin. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.